Welcome again to Ovarian Cancer Canada speaker series for April, the 411 on sexual changes after cancer. My name is Stephanie Goslin, and I'm the program's director, and I'll be your host for tonight's session. So I'm super excited to introduce you to our speaker tonight. It's Dr. Ann Katz. And Dr. Katz is the certified sexuality counselor and clinical nurse specialist at Cancer Care Manitoba in Winnipeg. Dr. Katz is also the author of 13 books for healthcare providers and healthcare consumers on the topics of illness and sexuality, as well as cancer survivorship. Dr. Katz's professional life is focused on providing information, education, and counseling to people with cancer and their partners about sexual changes that can occur during and after treatment. So we're super happy to have you with us tonight, Dr. Katz, and I wanna thank you again for taking the time, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and hello to everybody all over Canada. This is, uh, I'm smack bang in the middle of, of Canada, so um, I'm, uh, I'm really excited uh, to be here. So let me just share my screen. Um, I hope everybody can, uh, yes, I get, got a little message that you can see my screen. So um, I've been doing this work for 21 years, which is really hard to imagine. I started as a child. No, I'm kidding. Um, and it really has been, uh, you know, really a, a fantastic, uh, slightly later in life career. So tonight I'm going to talk about these topics. My focus really is on, so what can you do about it? Um, some, many, all of you may be experiencing these issues or some others. And please, you know, if, if I don't address something that you're going through, please do not hesitate to just put something down in the Q&A and Stephanie will pass on those, those uh, questions to me and hopefully I can answer them. So these are the five topics that I'm going to address today. So, you know, women, uh, and uh, if there are some men here, some caregivers, supporters, spouses, partners, um, Women often struggle with body image. Um, I've actually found in my practice where I do see men as well, that this is not an exclusive issue just for women. Uh, men increasingly are, are seeing, you know, the ideal uh, in magazines, et cetera, television. Um, so men who experience changes uh, in their body will also experience these, you know, some distress related to body image changes. But women certainly, um, because of the images that we see in social media, et cetera, the messages that society give us about how we're supposed to look. So changes in our body or even just dissatisfaction with our body um, can cause a lot of distress. I personally have been dealing with weight issues my whole life. My mother did, her mother did. Um, so this unfortunately is, is something that I have inherited. Um, and it really can be distressing and can impact on how we see ourselves, the confidence that we have in ourselves. Uh, even though uh, changes from surgery for gynecologic cancer, obviously including ovarian cancer, may not be visible to the world at large because it is, you know, we don't walk around with our lower abdomen exposed most of the time. Um, certainly it can impact on our sexual relationship and certainly it can impact on how we see ourselves even if the scars are really small. Uh, weight gain, from steroids, for example, as part of a chemotherapy regimen, this can cause significant and quite sudden weight loss resulting in stretch marks. Uh, and, and most women find the experience of being overweight, uh, you know, something that is not pleasant, particularly when, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's completely out of your control. Um, so what can we do about this? Oh, sorry, and I also forgot to mention weight loss. You know, and we live in a world where weight loss is something that is celebrated by people. Oh, you look lovely. You've lost so much weight or you've lost so much weight. And when it's because of cancer, it has a whole different meaning than from, you know, if you've been watching what you eat and engaging in exercise. So lots and lots of value placed on how we look. So what can we do about this? You know, there are certain things you can't change. The first thing is to have self-compassion. And I always say this with a little bit of hesitancy because self-compassion is not something that is particularly easy to achieve. Women are particularly hard 
on ourselves. Um, we, we overwork, we overload ourselves. We often sacrifice ourselves for our partner, for our children, for our family members and friends. And we judge ourselves so harshly and compare ourselves to other people. And I think this is often one of the struggles of in-person support groups, particularly for women, uh, where there is often, you know, unintended, but also uncontrolled judgment and particularly self-judgment that goes on. Something that has been shown in a number of research studies to be really helpful for body image, and you'll hear me talk about it in, in regards to some of the other topics tonight, mindfulness uh, it has been shown to be a highly effective intervention for a whole lot of the side effects of cancer and particularly cancer treatment. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is a way of being present to ourselves. It is different to that living in the present that you know, people with cancer are often told to do. Just live as if every day was your last. Um, I would like to smack the next person who says that to somebody with cancer. So if you know anybody, just send me their email and I'll give them a verbal smack. Human beings are very much future focused. We think about our next birthday, Christmas, we've just had Easter. Um, we think about the next you know, birthday of our, of our children. We're always looking into the future. So it's very hard to live each day as if it were your last. But being mindful, being fully present is a little bit easier, not that much easier. So a mindfulness practice, and the focus really is on the word and the act of being, of practicing. So being mindful, being present in the moment and being in a state of lack of self-judgment. And that is so important. So how can I explain what mindfulness is? Let me give you an example. I am sitting at the airport, traveling. There's a Colorado low that is coming toward Manitoba, bringing with it snow and ice and all kinds of uglies in the middle of April. Not something that I enjoy. Um, and I'm sitting in the airport and I am stressing about, is my flight going to go? Are we going to be on time landing in Toronto? Am I going to be on time to get my next flight? What's going to happen when I have to go through US customs? Blah, 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 blah. We've probably all had that experience. So what you can choose to do, and what I often choose to do, to tell you the truth, is to really, you know, fulminate over those thoughts. Let them build in my mind until I can feel my blood pressure going up, my pulse is raiding, I'm starting to breathe faster, and none of that is under my control. If I were to be practicing mindfulness in that moment, I would let those thoughts come into my head, but I would then let them go because ultimately I have no control over that. So mindfulness as it is practiced in terms of people who have cancer is not avoiding those thoughts, avoiding those anxieties, avoiding those feelings, it's allowing those feelings to happen, acknowledging them and letting them go like clouds pass by in the summer sky. I'm getting all poetic here, uh, forgive me. Um, so when you experience those feelings of, ugh, I feel unattractive or I've got the spare tie around my middle that I didn't used to have before, or you know, my hair's grown back all weird instead of as it used to be, Acknowledge those thoughts and then let them go because ultimately they are not under your control. Certainly communication with a partner is so important. Um, let me tell you a little story from my clinical practice. So some years ago, I saw a couple in my office. I haven't seen anybody in my office for the last two and a bit years and I can tell you I really miss it. I see my patients now mostly on Zoom, occasionally on the telephone and Honestly, there's a whole lot that I miss from, from being fully present in the room with, with a patient or a patient and, and their partner. So I was seeing um, a woman uh, who had cancer and 
at one point in, in our talk, she turned to her partner who was sitting about a foot away from her, just on the opposite side of a little round table that I have in my office. And she turned to him and she said to him, how can you even bear what I look like? How can you still desire me after all the damage that has been done to my body? And this poor man looked like a deer in the headlights. I could see, you know, the thought flashing through his head. What am I going to say? Am I going to put my size 13 foot in my mouth? And I stopped him from answering because I could see how panicked he was. And I said to her, let's stop for a minute. Does he still look the same way that he did 30 years ago? At which point we all laughed. Um, he was balding. He had that little tummy in the front. And she said, no, of course he doesn't look like he did 30 years ago. Look at him. He's balding. Um, the man was quite, appeared to be quite relieved uh, that he didn't have to answer the, qu the question. It didn't seem to mind that we put all this, this um, attention on him. And I said, there you go. In your eyes, right, his appearance may have changed, but he is still the man that you love. And we love the essence of our partner, not necessarily the outside appearance of, of him. And they do the same for us. But somehow, you know, we are really challenged to grant ourselves that kind of grace. Now, for someone who is unpartnered, uh, perhaps recently separated from someone, uh, the, the challenge is just that much greater because to start dating, to potentially expose yourself your feelings, certainly your body, to a new partner can be absolutely terrifying. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about this whole issue of disclosure. But I really want to acknowledge that for women who are single, these changes in body image have an additional layer of anxiety and distress. If I had a quarter for every woman who told me that she no longer experienced desire or libido, I would have a lot of quarters. Um, this is something that is extremely common uh, in women as we age. Many women who are partnered, and I would suggest men as well, want to go back to those heady days when you first get together with, with somebody new. And there's that, that infatuation, that thinking about the person all the time, that longing to be with them, that wanting to touch them. And I'm not even talking in a sexual way, wanting to hold hands, just want to, wanting to be in the presence of that person. There's actually a word for that in sex therapy world. It's called limerence. That goes away, fortunately or unfortunately. I think fortunately, because we cannot live in that heightened state of emotion and physicality because life gets in the way. But unfortunately, because those are amazing, amazing times. And many of us you know, would like to be like that or just a little bit like that when we've been in a, the same relationship for five, 10, 15, 20, for me, 40 years. Um, so you know, what can we do about this whole issue of loss of desire? This is something that is very, very difficult to deal with for me as a sexuality counselor, because libido or desire is tied up in all kinds of things. It's tied up in our body image, our physical appearance. It's tied up in what happened the last time we were with our partner, whether it was in a sexual way or if we were just kissing and canoodling, for example. Um, it's tied up with our level of fatigue, it's tied up with what's happening with our children or our parents or our siblings or friends. It's tied up in what's happening at work and it's absolutely tied up in the cancer experience. So there is no magic pill or potion for this. <clears throat> and if you were asking for that or looking for that, my apologies. However, what you will see on the right of your screen is something called the Basson model. Uh, Dr. Rosemary Basson is a physician in British Columbia. 
And she has developed and tested this model. So if you just bear with me for a couple minutes, I want to explain in simple terms what this means. Because I know often when people see a diagram like this, they, their head tends to explode. So starting in the top left-hand corner, if you are in a relationship where you are willing to be receptive to something from your partner, could be a poem, I'm kidding, who writes poems these days? But this is where sexual stimuli happen within an appropriate context. That sexual stimulus could be a touch on the back of your neck. It could be your partner taking out the garbage without being asked. That was a joke. Um, it is often then when people recognize that they are interested and the woman may even notice that there's a little bit of a tingle. Those are areas where, or those are experiences where spontaneous desire kicks in. What most women do will then um, attach that feeling of desire with that feeling of arousal. And this is where that responsive desire happens. So let me explain it another way. You're at the mall with your best friend and a very attractive person walks by, male, female, whatever, whatever floats your boat. And you look at that person, it might just be a passing glance and there's a little thought in your head that says, hmm, that's really interesting. That's spontaneous desire. When you're sitting, on the couch, watching television with your partner and his or her leg touches you and that thought pops into your head, that's responsive desire. So the message from, from this model is that while most of us long for spontaneous desire, that feeling of desire at different times of the day, for most women, desire is actually responsive. It happens in the context of a stimulus, your partner's leg touching yours, uh, that then initiates or prompts desire. So, you know, what I tell my patients is if you're sitting around waiting for spontaneous desire to kick in after everything that you have been through, you're going to be sitting around for a long time. Rather, if everything is okay in your relationship, rather be willing to initiate or to accept the initiation of something from your partner. And that does not mean penetrative intercourse. I really want to stress that. It might be, you know, making out for 20 minutes on the couch, like you did when you were 14, 15, or 16, where perhaps you were, you were not sexually active. Um, but, but if you allow that to happen, <clears throat> that is where that oxytocin the hormone of bonding, the hormone of attachment will be produced in your body. Uh, and, and that is a very good thing. <clears throat> Many women with gynecologic cancer or really with any kind of cancer that has impacted on the ovaries, causing a loss or cessation of the production of estrogen are going to experience painful sensation uh, in the genitalia. I am really, if, if any of you follow me on Twitter and you're quite welcome to, it's just at Dr. Ann Katz, um, you will always see me correcting someone who talks about the vagina. Um, the vagina is an internal organ. Uh, we use that commonly to, to, to name the entirety of women's genitalia. And the vulva is the most unused or underused word in the English language. So for many women, any kind of sexual touch anywhere on the vulva, way before anything attempts to go inside the vagina, causes extreme pain. I never use the word discomfort. I actually have a background as a midwife. And when people tell me that labor was uncomfortable, um, I have a big question mark shooting out of my head. Um, so for women who have experienced early menopause as a result of chemotherapy 
or removal, surgical removal of the ovaries. So, you know, no more uh, estrogen other than what is produced in our fatty tissues. Uh, will experience pain with genital touch. There may be pain when you uh, wipe yourself with, with toilet paper after urinating. Um, so, so, you know, this is really a significant issue. The medical term is vulvovaginal atrophy. Atrophy means death of tissues, not, not a very nice term, but essentially that is what is happening because the vulvar tissues are exquisitely sensitive to the loss of estrogen. So what are some of the things that you can do? Certainly for any kind of sexual touch, you need a decent lubricant. Um, I have a handout that I give to my patients. And if anyone is interested, uh, please email me and I will, I will provide you with that. My email address is on the last slide. Um, certainly moisturizers for daily comfort can also be um, helpful. Um, there are a number of these products uh, available to us in pharmacies, um, certainly at, you know, in the drugstore part of the, of the supermarket. Uh, you just got to be really careful about which product you choose to use because many of them contain parabens, um, glycerol, uh, glycerin, um, and a whole bunch of additives that can really be quite harmful. So the handout that I have for my patients is quite directive in terms of what to do. But certainly for any kind of sexual touch, you absolutely need to use a lubricant and not KY jelly. KY jelly is your grandmother's lubricant. If anybody's using KY jelly, please throw it away and, and, and get something decent. And, and um, I can certainly uh, name some products. Certainly, you know, your partner needs to know that it hurts. Um, and I not infrequently see uh, partners start to experience their own sexual problems when they realize that they are hurting the woman. So communication is so important. Um, we somehow are fixated on penetrative intercourse as the goal. Um, and that is never my goal for patients um, or the, the couples that I see. Uh, there are so many non-penetrative activities that are um, fun, enjoyable, and do not cause pain. Generally, when a woman experiences pain with any kind of sexual touch or with an attempt at penetration, the muscles of the pelvic floor are going to tense up to protect her from whatever is causing the pain. And what we see is that women develop a really rigid pelvic floor. Uh, there are about eight muscles involved in the pelvic floor. I can't name them all. I leave that to the experts who are pelvic floor physiotherapists. And a pelvic floor physiotherapist can be your best friend. So a very, very tight pelvic floor is going to cause pain in other areas of your life. It's gonna cause problems with urinating. It's gonna cause problems with constipation. Um, and this tends to be the natural result of pain with sexual touch. It's the, the muscles of the pelvic floor contracting and becoming hypertonic or really sort of over tense um, is your body's way of protecting you from pain. And it really does uh, need a pelvic floor physiotherapist to both assess what is going on, to identify any trigger points in those muscles, and to teach you how to help release those, those, um, those trigger points and to relax those muscles. This is not something that you can do yourself. Um, uh, really, seeing a specialist is very, very important. Uh, Changes in orgasm is something that, that I also see a lot of here uh, in, in my patients. Um, this once again can be related to body image. You know, they say the brain is the biggest sex organ. And if you're tense or anxious, um, you may notice that either orgasms are difficult to achieve uh, or you may never have achieved an orgasm. Um, so, so, you know, this may not really be a, a significant problem for you. And I'm not suggesting that having an orgasm is the be all and end all um, as, as, uh, as shown in a part of that Basson model that I didn't explain. Many women experience satisfaction without orgasm. So this is not something that you need to beat yourself up about. 
But once again, mindfulness, being present in the moment, being aware of sensations, not thinking about what does my body look like? Does my partner, you know, see my stretch marks or see my scars? Um, because all of that will take you out of the moment. Certainly spending extra time to in making sure that you're adequately aroused will help with lubrication, will help to, to perhaps in, in some way loosen the muscles of the pelvic floor. Um, so spending you know, as much time as you need, and you need to tell your partner that you are aroused uh, because he or she may not know this. You know, There's no blinking light on our forehead saying, okay, good to go. Um, vibrators can be amazing for this purpose because it will override all those messages that are in your head about what does my partner see? What is he or she thinking? And certainly, you know, it, it will overcome that little voice in your head. Um, uh, vibrators can be used on both men and women. Most people don't know that men can use vibrators as well. Vibrators can be inter used internally or externally. Um, there are some that are um, designed just for external use, though should not go inside the body, but there are many that are um, designed for both. Uh, once again, I have a handout on vibrators because you know this is something that, that many women find really difficult um, to, to figure out. Um, you know, a word of caution, um, if you go to a sex store, they will very often try to upsell you. So this is one area where I think going online uh, is a good idea. Uh, I know that many people have started, you know, going online to purchase things uh, during the pandemic, and hopefully this will give you a little a bit of comfort. So I have recommendations for that as well. And certainly a pelvic floor physiotherapist uh, can help here as well. I want to talk a little bit about disclosure. Uh, you know, how do you tell someone that you've had cancer? that you've got scars, that your body has changed, uh, that you can't have children if you're of childbearing age. Uh, this presents a huge challenge uh, to people who have, have gone through uh, treatment, both men and women. I think, you know, today, something like 60% of couples meet online. Um, I think in many ways, um, this provides a little bit of distance. Uh, because you can kind of check somebody out online uh, before perhaps agreeing to meet them for coffee. Um, I hear a lot of complaints from, from uh, particularly my female patients that they meet somebody online and then the person that shows up at, you know, for a, a coffee date or for a walk in the park is 20 years older than their picture suggested. Um, and you know, perhaps has body odor, or is just not what they what they seem to be. Um, something that I will never forget is um, I, I, I was seeing a, a man who's um, who'd had cancer, and his wife had died quite suddenly, and he was really lonely. He described himself as emotionally needy, and he was. So within about three months of his wife's passing, he decided to go online to meet somebody. Um, and one day he came to see me and he said to me, you won't believe how many women love fishing and hunting. Um, and I had to chuckle to myself because I'm not sure how many women love hunting and fishing, but I think people will often put in their profile something that they think will attract whoever they're trying to attract. Uh, but I think online dating really does provide that little bit of distance. I think it provides a little bit of safety to tell somebody that you've gone through cancer. Um, and if you never hear from them again, uh, your heart has hopefully not been engaged um, and, and it's not something that's going to impact on your self-confidence. Um, so online dating can be um, helpful. The other thing is to give yourself time. Um, if you rush into dating somebody, you know, you may get burnt, you may get hurt. Um, sometimes people just don't click and it's not about the history of cancer. It's just about something not clicking. Um, so give yourself time, decide when you are ready. 
You know, if your friends are telling you, get back on that bicycle, you know, you need to meet somebody and you don't feel ready, then just don't. And certainly, you know, forgiving yourself and forgiving a essentially virtual stranger who perhaps, you know, doesn't contact you again. Um, the timing may not be right for them. So that forgiveness, I think, is really important as well. Um, kindness uh, to yourself, uh, for yourself, is really important. <clears throat> so I see mostly couples in therapy or counseling because I believe that every cancer is a couple's cancer if somebody is in a relationship. I sometimes think that what I do mostly is actually communication counseling because communication underlies everything in a relationship. So one of the things that, that I see most frequently is that the couple is making assumptions about what the other person is thinking or feeling. I know I do that in my own relationship. I've been with the same person for mm, 45 years. And um, yes, we were children when we met. No, um, we were young adults. Um, but, you know, often I will assume that this is what my husband is thinking or feeling. And I know he does that to me as well. And we get it wrong probably 80% of the time. And I think the better you think you know the person, the more likely you are to, be ma to make assumptions about them because you know them really well. So you've got to communicate. You have to tell the person you're in a relationship what you are thinking and feeling because if they dream it up, they are going to get it wrong. They're going to act on that and that is going to cause sometimes arguments, often conflict, and most often misunderstanding. The other thing is that guilt has no place in relationships. I'm Jewish and we perfected guilt. Catholics invented guilt. That's, that's the joke uh, that I have heard. But it's easy to feel guilty, right? You're guilty about the way you look. You feel some guilty about getting cancer. I certainly hear that a lot. If only I hadn't, fill in the blank, smoked. If only I had exercised more. If only I had eaten well. Um, certainly those lifestyle factors may play a role in the development of cancer. But most of the cause of cancer is just cells multiplying in a, in a haphazard way. It is related to aging because our, our chromosomes get older, um, but it has very little to what you have personally done. So feeling guilty, feeling guilty about what you are doing or not doing for your partner, your partner feeling guilty because they still desire you, despite what you have gone through, there really is no place for guilt uh, in relationships, which can and do grow stronger after cancer. This is called personal growth, and I suggest relationship growth as well. And my goodness, there is so much suffering in cancer land. There has to be just a glimmer of a silver lining. And I think this is where personal and couples growth uh, really does come in, that strength that that, that couple will develop um, after having gone through something so terrifying, so challenging, so life-altering. So if you're experiencing an issue of any kind, please get help because help, help is available. What we know when it comes to sexual problems related to cancer treatment is that there is a deafening silence. And research has told us that your healthcare provider is quite willing to give you information to make a referral to somebody like me, but we want you to ask for help because we don't want to be seen as intrusive, sort of, interfering in a very private part of your life or your relationship. So we think that if it's a problem, you're going to raise the problem and going to ask for help. On the other hand, we know that 
patients or individuals going through treatment, wait for the healthcare provider to ask the question. Because we talk to you about things like diarrhea and vomiting and constipation and all kinds of yucky things. So if we healthcare providers uh, don't mention it, the person, the, the individual with cancer just assumes that this is something that the healthcare provider doesn't know about or doesn't want to talk about. Or you may be embarrassed because your healthcare provider, the nurse is perhaps the same age as your daughter or your parent. Um, uh, the healthcare provider, by the same token, may be reluctant to, to, to ask those questions because you're the same age as their mother. So as a result, we see this deafening silence. Um, this can be really difficult to talk about. I know, you know, I can talk about this over dinner with strangers. I certainly talk about it at the family table. I don't talk about my patients, but I can say all those words, penis, vagina, vulva, breast, makes no difference to me. I don't even blush. Um, but for normal people, uh, this can be really, really difficult. So one of the things that I suggest is first of all, make a list so that you have something in front of you because in the moment, I know you're going to forget to ask, feel embarrassed to ask. If you have a list written down, even if it's just two questions, um, it's something tangible, something in your hand. Tell your nurse or doctor that you have questions at the beginning of the appointment. So we know, healthcare providers know about something called the doorknob question. So as we're about to leave the room, our hand is on the doorknob. The patient says, uh, doc, uh, and there's an important question that needs to be asked and something that we need to address. And sometimes your doctor or nurse, their head, right, is already at the next patient or they're formulating what they have to type into or dictate into your chart. So at the beginning, say, I have some questions that I need to ask. Uh, and then the healthcare provider will say, well, go ahead, ask them now. Or they may say, um, just remind me when, I, you know, at the end of our appointment that you want to ask some questions. And then just ask. I have certainly blushed when a patient has asked me a question. Um, you cannot control a blush. It's just something that happens. I tend to make a joke about that. Um, I have certainly not known the answer in, in the moment for a patient's question, and I will always find an answer for them. Um, I have never known a healthcare provider to faint uh, when a patient asks them a question about sexuality, about sex. Uh, we will answer the question, uh, so don't be afraid to ask. So here is my contact information. Um, I have a podcast, which unfortunately I have really neglected over the last number of months. I think COVID ate my brain. I really do need to get back at that. Um, I have a website, terribly neglected. Um, my uh, Twitter is at Dr. Ann Katz. And of course I didn't put my email here, but my email is drannkatz at gmail.com. And I am more than willing to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I try not to give really specific advice because there are jurisdictional issues related to my license, but I can certainly try and provide you with um, somebody who you may be able to see where you live um, or just some general advice. And certainly I'm more than willing to share my handouts about vibrators and moisturizers and lubricants. On the right-hand side of your screen is the second edition of my book, Woman Cancer Sex. This was a book written for women uh, who have been treated or are being treated for cancer. It tells the story of a number of women um, and um, uh, gives evidence-based guidance and advice. Um, I think it is easily accessible. Um, and if you are interested, um, it is available on Amazon and other online book stores and certainly you can ask your local bookstore to get it for you. I am now going to stop sharing my screen. Is that okay, Stephanie? Yes, perfect. Um, thank you. Go. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, the way you make a, a subject that's 
some people might find difficult to talk about. You talk about it so candidly and easily. Um, I, I thank you. It was it was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, so we we do have several questions, um, and some people did submit questions in advance. So I'm going to read you some of those questions. Now, some of them I know you've touched upon in the presentation. I, I heard that, but I'm going to ask some of these anyway. So sure. the first the first question we had. I've recently had a total hysterectomy and have not engaged in any sexual activity since, and it's been about three months. Is it safe to resume? Can I injure myself in doing this? It was never made clear to me what my vagina and cervix is like now. If it's removed, what kind of cavity is up there? Sorry, I'm just confused and worried about it. And this is actually a topic, Dr. Katz, that I've heard a couple times come up in our TLTs over the past month. So I'll pass that one over to you. Firstly, I am so sorry that you were not given information about what has been done to you. Um, really, that is neglectful. First of all, there's no cavity up there. And this is something that I've heard a lot of. Um, uh, actually, one of the things that kind of got me into this work was um, I was working at, at one of our hospitals here at St. Boniface Hospital here in Winnipeg. Um, and I would go and speak to all women who were having a hysterectomy when they attended the pre-op uh, pre or pre-anesthesia clinic. And I will never forget walking to a room. There was a woman in her 40s with her husband. And I explained who I was and said, you know, do you have any questions? And the woman shook her head. And her, her husband opened his mouth to speak. And I remember she kind of shot him a look. It looked like, uh, almost, you know, she was almost worried about what he, he would say. And his question was, um, and I kind of understand why she was worried, but you know, his question was, okay, so a guy at work told me that his wife had this surgery and it, it was like a big bag up there. Um, and I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a nurse, so I managed to keep my face very, very calm in my head. I was thinking, let me at that guy who told you the story because uh, what a terrible thing to say. Um, the reality is that when you have a hysterectomy, most of the time they're also going to remove the cervix because that then protects any woman from getting cervical cancer in the future. It's a bit of a controversial topic. I won't get into that part. But anyway, they remove the cervix and then they sew the top together. And it, they, it's, called the, it's called the vault, they, they, the vaginal vault. They sew the top of the of the vagina to, together. The, so it's a circle. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a circle and they bring the two edges together. Think of it almost a bit like it when you fold a pierogi, right? Um, I wonder if that sounds weird, but I think it's a good way of, of sort of explaining it in 3D, right? You pinch the edges together and then they sew the edges together. So it's not, you know, this is not the highway to, I don't know where going, you know, going through your body. It is a closed tube, but certainly your vagina is likely to be a little bit shorter because when they do that, they actually um, remove the upper perhaps quarter to third of the vagina. So if the average vagina is about six inches long, the vagina is going to be a little bit shorter. So some women tell me that after, after hysterectomy, um, they can sometimes feel um, their partner's penis bumping up against the top of the vagina where it's sewn closed. Uh, and that can be uncomfortable. So there are ways of, of um, um, of with changing position or using um, a, a little um, a device called an O-nut. Um, it's a little silicone ring and you can actually stack them and it's put on the penis, which prevents deep penetration if it hurts. So that's, um, I think it's O-H hyphen nut. It's available online. They're a little bit expensive, but it's certainly something really helpful or certainly altering positions. So any position where the woman can control the depth of penetration. So for example, a woman on top, uh, sometimes side lying um, uh, can help. Um, generally we say six weeks after surgery, you're good to go. 
honestly, I don't know where that six weeks comes from. Somebody made that up years and years ago. You know, they say six right. weeks after childbirth, six weeks after you break your leg, you know, sit, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. But certainly I think, you know, it's it's scary, right? Because you mm -hmm. don't want to 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 hurt yourself. Your partner certainly doesn't want to hurt you. So my advice is go slow. Okay. Right? Maybe, you know, the first time, just kind of fool around, avoid penetration, or perhaps do something called outer course, where um, the woman put, now this doesn't work for women who are really thin and who have what apparently is called thigh gap. I don't know about thigh gap, because I don't have thigh gap, but apparently it's a thing. Um, so the woman would put some lubricant on her upper thighs, very close to her external genitalia. And instead of the man penetrating the vagina, he puts the, or you put the erect penis between your lubricated thighs. It, uh, it gives direct clitoral stimulation. And um, frankly, most men don't even realize they're not inside. Um, and that you know, I know with many of my patients is really, really helpful where perhaps there's pelvic floor involvement um, or some other issues for women, perhaps who've had vulvar cancer. Um, and, and, you know, there's really been surgical alteration of things, um, you know, but I would just, I would just say, you know, be kind to yourself, communicate with your partner. If it hurts, say so, right? Nobody should have to experience pain. You don't have to grit your teeth to get through it. Um, and, and, you know, if, you're, if your partner finds out a week, two weeks, three weeks, three months later that it's been hurting all this time, they are going to feel mm -hmm. absolutely awful. So honesty is always the best policy. So somebody asked, sorry, I'm just seeing this because it's kind of a follow-up. Yeah. Then how does the vagina function when the penis is inserted? Can sex bruise the top? Um, I guess theoretically it could cause bruising, but I would hate to think it gets to that point, right? Because if it feels uncomfortable, stop. Yeah, okay. Also Thank remember, you. yeah, I mean, sorry, remember, you can get a 10 pound baby through there right yeah. so so you know the vagina is a collapsed yeah. tube um and it really you know i've never seen a penis the size of a 10 pound baby if any <laughs> of you have take a picture and send it to me <laughs> it's hard to ask sorry Stephanie, that, was, yeah, that. <laughs> that was a commercial break um okay i'm going to move on to the next question dr katz um i am brack up to positive and have ovarian cancer that's been in remission right now. Following my last surgery, nerve damage was done to my bladder and I can no longer void on my own, but require self-cauterization five to six times per day. I have noticed that my libido is pretty much gone, but also that I have UTIs following sex. Any suggestions? Vaginal estrogen, firstly. So this has become a huge, huge thing on Twitter. It's, uh, it's actually kind of quite amusing because I've been advocating for this for years and suddenly it's become this hot topic. Okay. But so with the loss of estrogen that comes with the surgical removal of the ovaries or uh, for women after menopause, estrogen is in part um, connected to the development of collagen one of the reasons why we get wrinkles as we get older is because of loss of collagen which is related to loss of estrogen right drinking things with collagen is not going to help with wrinkles just that <laughs> that's an fyi so what happens is with the loss of estrogen the collagen matrix the collagen architecture of the pelvis kind of loosens so this is one of the reasons why often women will get a, a urinary tract infection after sex is because of friction, for example. The other thing is that with self-catheterization, you know, so often as, as hygienic and as clean as you are, the likelihood is that some of that irritation is causing those urinary tract infections. You may be by accident um, 
getting some bacteria into the bladder and that's what's causing those urinary tract infections, which is no fun. Um, anyone who's ever had a urinary tract infection will tell you it's no fun. Um, but certainly I think trying some local estrogen in the form of either a cream or their little tablets, it's called Vagi Femme. I actually prefer those little tablets. And here I am giving medical advice, please don't sue me. Um, but um, so the cream is actually made from the mare of pregnant, from the urine of pregnant horses, pregnant mares. Uh, the little tablets are made of estradiol, which is actually a form of estrogen that the body really likes. So speak to your primary care provider um, or your, your um, oncologist or your gynecologist about just trying these, these tiny little tablets. They're about, they're probably smaller than one of those, than a, certainly than a Tylenol and you insert it into the vagina. There's no discharge associated with it. You start off using it every other day for about three weeks, and then you can really dial back. So some women just need to use it once or twice a week, um, and it really helps with estrogenizing, I'm not sure that's a word, but, but keeping the vagina um, really nice um, and, and more like it used to be pre-surgery or pre-menopause. Okay, thank you for that, because that actually was another question that I had here that a woman had been prescribed, prescribed a topical estrogen, um, but she had never heard that recommended before. So I, I think you answered that question. She wondered if yeah. it was a waste of time and money helpful, or was it in any risk? So I don't understand what topical estrogen means, because there are some, for example, naturopaths that are recommending yam cream that you rub into your skin, total garbage. I mean, you'd have to, I, I, yeah, but this is, so this is what we call local estrogen. Okay. So it's applied into the vagina or in the, in the case of the Premarin cream, which is the, the kind that I'm not particularly fond of, you can actually apply some of that to the external genitalia as well. It tends to be a bit goopy and messy. Um, okay. And it's, yeah. So, you know, the only reason... No, I'm just going to keep quiet. Okay, I'm going to let that one go. It gets too complex. Okay. Okay. Here's another question that we have that I think you touched on a little bit in your presentation. Is No one told me about vaginal dilators to, pre to prevent atrophy when I had a hysterectomy. So it was due to uterine stromal sarcoma, which was 17 years ago. At this point, would it be possible to have some reversal of atrophy using a dilator now? Yeah, so dilators. Interesting, interesting question. I actually run a program for women who've had um, rectal or anal cancer and who have radiation because we get because the the lower rectum and anal area share a wall with the vagina and you can get ra radiation damage inside the vagina. Um, so, you know, so we advise those women for certain amount of time to use dilators because there's tissue damage which can cause the walls of the vagina to actually um, glom together. That's a very professional term. I am always a little bit hesitant to recommend dilators for a woman who hasn't had radiation but who is having problems with penetration mostly and generally that's because they're having pain with penetration and often they'll be recommended to use dilators. I don't like dilators in that context because I think it puts so much focus on penetration, right? right? It's a foreign object that the woman essentially has to use. And I think it starts involving, you know, your, your brain and your emotions. And I don't think it does any good. I think there, that's where a pelvic floor physiotherapist can be so, so helpful. 17 years after treatment, I don't know. Honestly, there, I think a really good examination by a gynecologist who has an interest in these kinds of things. Um, and I don't know where this, this person lives, but certainly, you know, a really good examination, um, perhaps with a speculum, if that's possible. And I would use a, what we call a pediatrics uh, speculum. It's really, really small. 
Um, certainly an experienced gynecologist may be able to feel if there is scar tissue there, right? Because scar tissue doesn't, doesn't flex, doesn't stretch, um, is perhaps the way to go. I'm really hesitant to sort of start talking about stretching and this kind of, of thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question that's just come in here. Um, I am a young cancer, a young ovarian cancer survivor, and I have not been sexually active since my total hysterectomy one and a half years ago. My question is, when I have a partner, if he were to ejaculate in my vagina, I'm concerned about semen, semen staying up there and causing problems like bacterial flare up, bad smell, etc. Since I no longer menstruate, there is no self cleaning mechanism. Should I be concerned? Or what is the recommended for male ejaculation post hysterectomy? What goes in must come out. So first of all, the vagina is a self-cleaning organ. We should not okay. be putting anything in there to clean it. Any ejaculate will naturally flow out. Um, please do not douche, uh, not even with water because you interfere with the natural balance a uh, pH balance, acid-base balance in the vagina, and that's when you start to experience problems. So, you know, if you are really, really concerned, get in to wear a condom. Um, I would use, ex always, always use extra lubricant. Um, and because sometimes, you know, condoms, even though they are, they do contain some lubricant, it's actually not a great lubricant. Um, it, 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 they're lubricated with something called nonoxonal 9, which is designed to kill sperm. Um, and so it's a pretty harsh lubricant. So I would use lots of extra lubricant, particularly a silicone lubricant. Um, yeah, but, but, you know, the semen itself is not full of germs. Um, it's, you know, probably pretty sterile. Um, so, so, and the body will take care of it. Sorry, I was muted there. Thank you. Um, one other question here. My marriage ended before I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I really want to start dating again. And I never planned on telling a potential partner that I've only ever been with my husband. But I don't think I can avoid telling them that I've had cancer. Any advice on how to have that conversation with a potential partner? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, I mean, that's kind of difficult. You know, I think it's, so this is the advice that I've been given by somebody who's been through this. She told me that the first time you have coffee or go out for dinner or whatever, go for a walk in the park, the first time feels a little early, right? Because if you don't see that person ever again, you're naturally going to think, oh, it's because I had cancer. And then that's going to mm -hmm. impact on your willingness to try again. It might just be that, you know, he, didn't feel a, he or she didn't feel a connection right? And it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. And so, you know, you should try again. This person then told me that it feels like by the third date, it feels like she's hiding something if she hasn't told. So she told me that she tells on the second date. Other people have said to me, this is the first thing they say to somebody because they want to weed out all the dummies, right? They don't want to waste any time on somebody who's, you know, who's not for whom this is an insurmountable barrier. I think you've got to be a little bit careful, right? Particularly for younger people who, who the other person may never have ex known anybody who had cancer. And what is the right way to, to respond to, I had cancer, right? I don't know if there's a right way. Right. And it also depends on the individual with cancer, what a correct response would be. So sometimes when you, you, you know, when you put it out there immediately, the other person is going to be shocked, speechless, confused, may need to get up and go to the bathroom because they just need to kind of, you know, clear their head, figure out what to do. And how you interpret that is really up to the individual. Right. So I think you've got to find comfort within yourself. Um, you know, I don't think that only having sex with one person is a bad thing. Uh, I think in many ways, it's a really good thing, right? Because it means that, that you are somebody who cares about a relationship and is not, you know, I mean, I'm not casting judgment. It doesn't, I mean, to me, you know, whatever. 
Um, but, you know, I think at some point you do have to tell um, th that because, because that cancer has made you what you are now. Right. Now, we did have a question, and I know you addressed this before, is um, could we get a, a, good, a list of the good lubricants to use? Yeah, absolutely. So just, I mean, I'm just going to give you sort of a little, a little primer on this that may be helpful. Okay. Essentially, there are two and a half kinds of lubricants. There are water-based lubricants and there are silicone-based lubricants. Silicone-based lubricants are the best. They stay slippery the longest. You can't use them with a sex toy or a dilator or a vibrator that is covered in silicone, but they're great for any kind of fooling around, genital touch, certainly for penetration. Astroglide makes a silicone lubricant. It's called Astroglide Diamond. And KY has just come out with a silicone lubricant. I cannot remember the name, but you have to look on the box or on the bottle or on the tube. And if it says silicone, or cymethicone. If the word ends in C-O-N-E, it's a silicone-based lubricant. So Astroguide lubricant for one, um, and you can get those at most drugstores. Water-based lubricants um, are cheaper, more readily available. Um, you Once again, you've got to look at the label. And honestly, I spend a lot of time, I actually go to drugstores and I take pic a picture on my phone of anything new. And then I come home, I can't do this at work because the sites are blocked. I come home and I see what's in them. You've just got to be really careful because often there are a lot of additives. You know, if you see the ingredient list and it's about yay long, don't get that one, right? Because it's going to have all kinds of stuff. Astroglide Naturals, I don't get any money from this company, but Astroglide Natural is mostly vitamin E and um, I've forgotten the other ingredient. Sorry, I've just had a complete brain fart. Um, so Astroglide Natural, um, it's confusing, but please, if you do want a copy of that, I don't want to sort of just have it out there in the internet somewhere, just email me and I'm just, you know, put in the subject line, lubricants or lubes, um, and I will send you my handout. Okay, perfect. And for everybody um, on the call, I have put Dr. Katz's Twitter handle and her email address um, just in the right on the chat there. So you have that. Now, I we do have time. If people have more questions, feel free. This is a, a great time. Um, I have one more, um, and it's a regular pap test still recommended following a hysterectomy for my type of cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, it depends. So this is something you need to talk to your oncologist about. Um, you know, sometimes they will continue to do that, particularly for women who've had cervical cancer, because there is a, some risk that they could have some cancer cells in what, you know, in the, in the vaginal vault. With ovarian cancer, I do not believe so, but please check with your oncologist or your primary care provider or your GYN. Okay. Excellent. So I, I I'll just hang on one second. I think maybe one more just came um, in the chat here mm -hmm. in the chat box. Um, how, how do you feel sexy with a huge scar on your stomach and perhaps a post ileostomy poop bag glued to your stomach? Yeah, big challenge that cover up. Nobody ever said that you needed to be day you were born naked when you are with a partner or by yourself, right? With self-stimulation or masturbation. I'm allowed to say that, aren't I, Stephanie? I've said just about everything else. <laughs> yeah, you know, if it bothers you, cover up, right? Because you're not going to be relaxed if all you're thinking about, and particularly with a so-called poop bag, uh, you know, people are generally terrified that it's going to explode if it's, you know, whatever. So, cover up. Uh, if you do have an ostomy bag, whether it's an ileostomy or a co colostomy, and often the ileostomy is the, the, the feces are more fluid, so, so it's problematic. Um, but depending on where the stoma is, you can actually plug it off, remove the bag and plug it off. It doesn't work if you have very liquid stool going into the bag. But a, an ostomy therapist or an ostomy nurse will have a be able to tell you a whole range of things that you can use. Some people will use like a cummerband, 
Um, so like an elastic band that goes around the waist and anchors the bag. Um, you can actually get covers for the bag so that you can see what's inside it. Crotchless panties, two words. So um, you can get these online now. You don't even have to go into a CD sex store. Um, so these are, they generally have a wide band that really will anchor, that will anchor an ostomy, um, certainly, um, you know, cover a scar. Um, you know, I think that, that um, you know, flannel from here to your, to your toes is perhaps not exact, exactly sensual, but a man's cotton shirt can be really sexy. So, you know, you can unbutton, you can button. Um, if it has those, I don't know what they're called, you know, that sort of those cutouts uh, on the side, um, you know, you really, if, if being naked and being concerned and feeling, um, uh, you know, self-critical or really sensitive about what you look is not going to make for an enjoyable experience. So cover up. Preferably not, you know, a ready camp t-shirt from 1982, uh, but, you know, something that you feel good in. And, and you know, that doesn't have to be going to La Vie en Rose or uh, Victoria's Secret to buy something that is really overtly kind of sexual, um, perhaps, you know, doesn't work for everybody. If it works for you, go ahead and spend $129.99 on something with, you know, feathers and, and fur. I wanted to add too, I, I know a woman who she had um, matching covers made for her ostomy bag, so it matched what she was wearing. Mm -hmm. um, one more question here. Um, since my hysterectomy and chemo, my vaginal flora has obviously changed. I now get yeast infections from anything and everything, sex, masturbation, wipes, etc. Why and how can I not get so many of them? Yeah, so you know, one of the things about yeast infections is often they're not yeast infections, they're something else. Um, so there is a, um, there's a gynecologist by the name of Dr. Jen Gunter, G-U-N-T-E-R. She's actually originally from Winnipeg. She now lives in San Francisco. She's very outspoken. And she has written two amazing books. The first is called the Vagina Bible, which I think we should all have. And certainly if you have teenage or young adult daughters, get them the Vagina Bible. It teaches you everything you need to know and a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need to know. As well as her latest book is called The Menopause Manifesto. So good for, for those of us who are approaching that freeing age, as well as you know those of us who have unfortunately had an early menopause um, or related to chemotherapy or surgery. Um, she has a website and she, you can also sign up for her emails. And she just did a whole long, a whole long post about this issue of yeast and how often we actually think it's a yeast infection and it's not. Um, so I'm not suggesting, um, the person who answered that question, I'm not suggesting necessarily that you're wrong, but get it checked out. Um, you know, it may be that the pH balance in your vagina is a little bit off and what you're getting is some bacterial overgrowth, um, but certainly this is something that can be treated. And often what we tend to do is we, you know, we assume everything's yeast, so we're using canestin over and over and over again and, it's, you know, and it's not helping um, because it might not be yeast. So look up Dr. Jen Gunter. Um, and on her website, you will find the thing about, you know, is it yeast or, or what is it? It's really very, very helpful. Okay, excellent. So I think people are, we've got a few more questions in here now. So if, we can take it, if you've got another 10 minutes or so, yeah, I'd like absolutely. to try to get through these. Um, so this one is going back to the lube before. So regarding the lube, probably that stuff should not go in your mouth. Um. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing, right? So a lot of lubes contain glycerin to sweeten them because they make the assumption it's gonna go in someone's <laughs> mouth. <laughs> um, um, and frankly, I have not tried to taste them. I'm kind of a little bit tempted to do that now. So after this, I might just go and try. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you just gotta get the timing right. So um, yeah, I wouldn't put lube in my mouth. Okay. Thank you. Okay, another question here. So after hysterectomy, I am experiencing a loss of desire. Can we talk a little bit about porn? Would that be helpful? 
or is touch better for stimulating? Anything that gets you going. So I am not philosophically opposed to porn. I know a lot of women are. A lot of porn is very much directed at the male gaze and may not be a turn on for women. Um, certainly there is porn that is made by women for women. And that's what I would put in the search, right? Porn for women, by women. And porn for women tends to be have more of a storyline, a beginning, middle and end. Um, it's perhaps a little bit more erotic uh, than, uh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, or no, thank you, just wham, bam, uh, which is sort of more male oriented porn. Um, you know, as we get older, both men and women need more direct forms of stimulation. So if you need visual image, go for it. If you, you know, if there's music that gets you going, if there's a podcast that gets you going, and boy, there are a lot of podcasts <laughs> out there, not mine, my podcast will not get you going. Um, <laughs> and um, um, yeah, but certainly, you know, and certainly a vibrator can also really, really help because that is going to get your arousal up right, which in turn influences your desire, will create that reactive desire. Thank you. Um, next question. I have not had sexual anything with a partner since my full hysterectomy this past winter. I have, however, used vibrators and noticed that after using, I bleed a little. Is this normal or is that an issue that means I should stop using them? So, once again, it depends if it's internal or external. If it's internal, you probably the little bit of breathing, bleeding that you're having is probably related to friction. And that can happen externally as well. Because if the tissues are dry, the vibration from the vibrator is going to cause a little bit of, of friction. Use some lube with it. Or if you're just using it externally, put, put something, a sheet, underwear between you and the vibrator. Obviously you can't use fabric in your vagina. Thank you. Um, now there is a question here, which I think you answered. This woman missed the first 20 minutes of the presentation and she's just wondering how does one increase a libido? Uh, my husband has been great and understanding, but I'm just not interested. How can one change that after a complete hysterectomy and removal of the ovaries? So I know you did touch on that a little bit at the beginning of the presentation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. You know, I just, I just, and perhaps it's a, you know, it's a good thing to, to sort of reinforce this, that for, for many women, we don't walk around in a state of desire, right? Naturally, never mind if you've been through, a, you know, a hysterectomy and treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if, if you are in a relationship where you can start kissing and canoodling, Right, so you know the if you can start making out. Often people don't know what I'm talking about when I say canoodling. So once you start making out, you may find that is when your desire kicks in. But if it doesn't, the relationship has to be such that if you say no, there aren't going to be bad consequences, right? And you know my response always is if either of you are aroused and the other partner just isn't interested in going further, masturbate. Take care of yourself. Thank you. So we have two questions left. So we'll, we'll go through these two. Um, my oncologist has not addressed hormones at all since my ovarian cancer hysterectomy surgery. I'm going through a lot of discomfort from this and wondering if I should be pushing to see someone additional to discuss hormone therapy. I am still doing chemo, which I wonder if that's the reason, but no reason has been given when I ask. You know, there's this weird thing that, I mean, first of all, sometimes oncologists are embarrassed, uncomfortable. I mean, you know, they're people, right? They're human beings. We all come from where we come from. Nobody told me about menstruation at all, ever, right? And when I asked my mother, she said, I thought you knew. I'm not, I don't know where I would have known. There was no internet in those days. Anyway. So, so, you know, we get uncomfortable. There's also this sort of attitude of too sick for sex, right? If you're having chemotherapy, you can't possibly be sexually active or desirous or anything like that. So ask the question. You know, certainly there is discomfort on the part of oncologists if a cancer is hormonally dependent about 
using hormones, right? That's a whole discussion for, that these oncologists need to have and I'm prepared to have it with them. Um, but certainly raise the topic, you know, um, uh, you've probably, you know, hopefully you've, you've told your oncologist about other side effects. This is just another side effect, right? Hey, I'm really, I'm really dry down there. I always laugh when I say down there because down there is like Australia, right? Really big. You need to know if it's Perth or Sydney or Melbourne or the Gold Coast. But anyway, you know, sometimes that helps if you're too scared or embarrassed to say my vagina is dry or my valve is dry. I'm really dry down there. I heard that I could use some local hormones. How about it? Right? Mm -hmm. Or speak to your primary care provider. Sometimes primary care providers are really reluctant to prescribe anything while you're undergoing chemotherapy because they're, they're scared of some sort of interaction. So, you know, I believe that the person who's prescribing chemotherapy, the person who's doing surgery, the person who's doing radiation has a responsibility to talk about all the side effects and that includes sexual side effects. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last question. Um, I see a, pelvi a, a pelvic floor osteo. She uses the dilator method and it has been working, although I haven't been able to get the biggest one in yet. I still get lots of pain. What is the difference with the pelvic floor physiotherapist and what sort of things do they do or can they recommend? So pelvic floor physiotherapists often recommend dilators and I have an issue with that. And I work with a group of pelvic floor physiotherapists and I tell them quite openly, stop with the damn dilators, right? So do you need to be able to use the biggest dilator? I think it depends on the size of your partner's penis if you have a partner with a penis. That's the first thing, because sometimes the biggest ones are like really huge. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, I forgot what the question was. Oh, Just what about, do they do? Yeah. Oh, what do they do? So they, I mean, first of all, they work internally. So people need to know that, right? If you go to a pelvic floor physiotherapist, she's going to put one or two fingers into your vagina and you may not like that. So fair warning. Um, but that is how they assess the muscles of the pelvic floor and they can do um, um, like essentially manual massage to get those muscles to relax and they can teach you how to do it. But, you know, one of the issues with pelvic floor physiotherapy is that this is not covered in, a, in, a, in, the, in the physiotherapy program. So a lot of physiotherapists go to these weekend seminars where Saturday is for female, for female patients and Sunday is for male or vice versa. And personally, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with just a one day thing. Um, I'm very, very fortunate that the pelvic floor physiotherapy practice that I work with here in, uh, in Winnipeg the owner of the practice has a PhD in pelvic floor physiotherapy. She studied at the University of Melbourne in Australia that has a specific program. Um, so, so um, and she's trained all her physiotherapists and the other physiotherapists that have also done this program in Australia. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of buyer beware there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the Physiotherapy Association of Canada, if you Google that, you'll actually find them. Um, they probably have a list of people who are properly trained. Okay, great. So that's the end of our question. So um, it took people a while to get rolling and get comfortable, but you see we had a ton of great questions at the end. So thanks everybody for participating. Um, I just wanted to read a couple of comments here. Thank you so much for this great, fun, and very informative presentation. Um, thank you. Very, we've just got some really great comments in there. So um, thank you for that. And again, I just you're so candid and your humor makes a subject that a lot of us find uh, awkward maybe to talk about so easy. So thank you so much for being with us tonight and for, for the presentation. So I just, um, you know, I just, I just, I'm really sensitive sometimes that, you know, everybody's sense of humor is a little bit different. And if there's anybody who has been offended by my use of humor, my apologies, it was never meant to offend anybody. But, you know, if you lose your sense of humor, eek, you're really sunk. And I think really it, it, it helps. It helps me deal with a really sensitive topic and something that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, 
affects me too. I hate to see women suffer and I know there's so much suffering here. So thank you, Stephanie, for this opportunity. I'm so glad we finally got to do that after yes. my little <clears throat> hiccup in <laughs> that February. Have a great summer, everybody. If summer ever comes to Manitoba, I'll let you know.